Welcome, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to the 2022 U360 Capstone and Commencement Ceremony. Uh, it's been such a year, um, and these students have worked so hard. I'm just so excited that we've reached this point, and I hope you will join me in just bringing a celebratory and excited and inspiring feel to this evening. Um, so my name is Molly Jacobs. I'm Manimit's Vice President for Environmental Education and Outreach. Our education programs here at Manimet are all about educating and inspiring the next generation of environmental stewards. And as an organization, our mission is that we are, we've, our vision is that we envision a world where ecosystems and human communities thrive together. Um, U360 is absolutely central to this vision because U360 students, the ones you're gonna hear from tonight and all of the ones here on this call um, have been working and learning at the intersection of business and sustainability. So they're doing the hard work. They're helping us figure out as a human society, how we um, can be successful as human communities and also uh, be good stewards and conserve nature for future generations. Um, and U360 students really are learning the skills they need to go out and be the change makers of tomorrow. So uh, Manimet envisions a world full of U360 alumni, like these students and like the students that have gone before them who have all gotten fantastic jobs all across industries, both um, in the conservation field, in sustainability, but also outside of it. Um, and who are working across the spectrum to make the world a better, more sustainable and more rewarding place to live. So, uh, so it, this is really um, celebratory and profoundly hopeful uh, time of the year for me. I think all of us are going to leave this evening excited and hopeful for the future. So um, with that, it gives me great pleasure to now introduce Laura Babb, the U360 Program Director, who's going to uh, get us started um, with the events of the evening. So thank you very much again for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Molly. And thank you all for joining us today for our U360 commencement and capstone competition for the class of 2022. With this culminating event, we conclude a two week competition, bring another amazing U360 year to a close and celebrate all of the exceptional students who participated in our business sustainability internship this year. We will also see one student named Manamet's Next Generation Scholar for 2022 after watching our three finalists present their sustainability action plans for a small business to a panel of judges. But before I introduce today's presenting students to you and we start hearing their perspectives on sustainability, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you more about U360 and exactly what all of our students have done with us at Manomet this year. Today's younger generation is the largest in history and known as the climate change generation, they will be disproportionately impacted by today's environmental, social and economic challenges of which there are many. With their futures affected the most, the next generation must be actively engaged and trained to make our world more sustainable. One primary way college students can be part of the solution is through their future careers and workplaces. And students from all disciplines, not just environmental majors, must be prepared to tackle today's urgent sustainability issues. We need increased participation from young people with diverse backgrounds who have the ability to create sustainability solutions that they can bring to any job or industry. However, college students often lack the real world understanding of practical sustainability, as well as the soft skills employers most seek and are needed to be effective change makers. They need to know how to work with people who think differently from them and how to create practical solutions and must possess the professional and interpersonal skills necessary to engage others in problem solving. And these things cannot be learned through coursework alone. As such, U360 is designed to give college students experience in three areas that are vital to solving today's complex sustainability challenges and that are not taught in the classroom. The first is career skills, specifically the ones employers most seek, like professionalism, teamwork, communication skills, creative problem solving, strategic thinking, 
and a strong work ethic. The second is an understanding of practical applied business sustainability. Students leave U360 equipped with an extensive real world understanding of both business management and how sustainability practices can help a company make money, save money and reduce risks, in addition to being good for the planet and society. And the third is the ability to work with people who think differently from them. Solving complex challenges like climate change requires bringing people to the table with different viewpoints, knowledge, and experience. And U360 teaches college students how to do just that. U360 is a two semester experiential education and professional development program, kind of like a cross between a course and an internship. The curriculum begins with six weeks of educational workshops and skills trainings focused on business sustainability principles, professional communication, time and project management, interview skills, and professional ethics. Then for the next 20 weeks, each student reaches out to approximately 150 small and medium-sized businesses of their choosing to request an interview about their current practices. Each student interviews up to 20 of those businesses and administers Manomet's small business sustainability assessment of their environmental, social, and governance practices. During the fall semester, the students interviewed a wide variety of businesses, and in the spring semester, each student chose an industry, topic, or business owner demographic to focus on and interviewed all businesses within that sector. After every interview, the business's data are analyzed, and I follow up with the businesses to give them their sustainability scores and access to our online toolkit that they can use to improve their practices. Consistently, 75% of businesses report that the experience of being asked those questions about their business was highly valuable, and over a third say it's highly likely they'll make changes to their practices as a result of that interview. The 6 million small businesses in this country have a large collective environmental footprint, but are often overlooked and underserved when it comes to sustainability efforts. With time, financial, and resource constraints, Small businesses have many barriers that can make it challenging to prioritize sustainability. U360 gives them the opportunity to evaluate their overall sustainability, many for the first time, while gaining tools to help them increase the overall health of their business. And for our students, this direct engagement with the business owners provides them with the majority of their experiential education and professional development in U360. And then during the last six weeks of the program, each student creates a sustainability action plan for one business they interviewed with customized, highly researched, feasible recommendations for how the business could improve its sustainability practices. But more on that in a bit. After creating their action plans, each student presents theirs to two U360 alumni judges and a video recording is made of the presentation. The videos are then entered into the preliminary judging round where a panel of sustainability and business professionals view, evaluate, and score the presentations on several different criteria. The students who receive the top three scores in that round advance to our final competition, the event we're all here for today. Since piloting U360 in January of 2016, with just three students from the University of Southern Maine, the program has grown and expanded substantially. And this year, we expanded the program further than ever with students enrolled throughout the East Coast. Over the past five years, 138 students have participated in the program from 41 different colleges. And these students have engaged nearly 1,650 small businesses from all 50 states and two other countries. We're also very proud that U360 is helping to foster women leaders in business and STEM as nearly 80% of the students who have participated in the program are female. This year, 24 students enrolled from 20 colleges from as far north as Orono, Maine, all the way down to Tampa, Florida. Over the past two semesters, 222 small businesses from 37 states, one province, two countries, and Washington, DC had conversations with our students about their current sustainability. And keep in mind that the more than 200 business owners took the time to talk with one of our students during an ongoing pandemic that has deeply impacted small businesses, which makes that number all the more impressive. 
Again, the purpose of U360 is to train and prepare the next generation to tackle the complex sustainability challenges that will most impact their futures. As such, the program is focused entirely on giving college students the real world experience and the personal and professional development they need to be effective change makers. Our U360 students learn firsthand how dozens of different small businesses operate, gain vital career skills and meaningful work experience, see how the principles they're learning in school are applied in the real world, and develop the tools necessary to create a more sustainable world. Most importantly, they learn how to have hard conversations with people who think differently from them, find common ground, and create feasible solutions that make the world a better place. But the students wouldn't be able to achieve the educational or professional development objectives of U360 without the generosity of business owners and other professionals who give their valuable time to the students. People like our esteemed guests today who will serve as judges in our competition. Every year, our panel of judges is composed of two professionals in the business sustainability and or higher education fields and the winner from a previous year's capstone. I'm pleased to introduce you all now to our panel of judges for today's competition. So if they would all like to join me on screen. All right. It looks like we have almost, so Lauren turn her video on. We'll start with her. So Lauren Sullivan is our first judge. Um, as the founder and co-executive director of Reverb, Lauren combined her lifelong passion for environmental activism with the power of music to create a nonprofit that has been leading the green music movement since 2004. Lauren was moved to start Reverb to leverage the unrealized potential of live music to amplify the reach and impact of nonprofits that were doing crucial environmental work. By partnering with artists and engaging fans with a positive solutions focused message at concerts, she saw an opportunity to educate and empower thousands of people every year, inspiring countless concert goers to take action in their own lives and alongside the nonprofits they were meeting at shows. Nearly two decades later, Lauren continues to guide Reverb as it has expanded beyond fan engagement to also include comprehensive sustainability solutions for the music industry and artist outreach. Lauren has also helped lead groups of musicians to the rainforests of Guatemala and Peru to get a firsthand look at the effects of illegal logging on local and indigenous communities as part of Reverb's hashtag no more bloodwood campaign. With a strong focus on Reverb's mission, Lauren directs the organization's legal, financial, human resources, governance, and grant programs while helping to chart a path for the future through effective partnerships. Lauren earned a BA in social psychology and Spanish from Tufts University and an MS in environmental education from the Audubon Expedition Institute at Lesley University. Welcome Lauren, it's great to have you here today. Next on the judges panel, we have Trisha Dinkle. Trisha is the director of Clean Tech Navigate, the Northeast Clean Energy Councils or NECECs signature innovation program that provides clean tech startup access to resources and business support to help them grow and scale. Trisha previously served as senior program manager for NECEC's Clean Tech Open Northeast. She comes from a background in energy management and environmental policy. Before joining the Clean Tech Open team in 2019, Trisha managed the energy disclosure reporting teams at we Go Wise, an energy management SaaS company headquartered in Boston. She has also served as the executive chair for the Green Business Engagement National Network and on the University of Colorado Environmental Board and Sustainable CU Committee. Trisha holds an MA from the University of New Hampshire in environmental education and a BA from the University of Colorado in environmental policy. Welcome, Trisha. Thank you for being here. And last but not least, we have Nicholas Massiello. Nick was born and raised in Northwest New Jersey and graduated from the University of Vermont in 2018 with a sustainable business degree. He is currently a sales analyst at Edison Energy, a subsidiary of Edison International, which advises large commercial and industrial clients on managing their energy costs, reducing their carbon emissions, and navigating their complex energy supply and demand needs. Outside of work, he is an avid hiker, skier, and craft beer enthusiast. He currently lives in the North End of Boston 
and enjoys reading nonfiction, exploring the outdoors, and playing with his cat, Indy. Nick also participated in the U360 internship in 2017 and was Manomet's very first Next Generation Scholar, awarded that distinction exactly five years ago when he was a junior at UVM. We're thrilled to see the important work he's done in the ener energy sector since completing U360 and to have him back today on the other side of the judges table. Welcome back, Nick. Now onto the competition. As I mentioned, each of these students will present their sustainability action plan for one business they interviewed this year. To maintain the confidentiality promised to the businesses, the students will not be specifying the business's name or exact location. They'll give biographical information about the business, identify what they see as the biggest external threat facing the business, and then present recommendations to improve its long-term viability, all of which must be highly researched, practical, feasible, and most importantly, beneficial to the business's bottom line. They will also specify the two recommendations they see as the highest priorities for the business to implement. These students will demonstrate how strong environmental, social, and governance practices can help a business thrive and prosper in a natural world and business landscape that are rapidly changing, while also attracting, engaging, and retaining talent and customers in the process. Following each presentation, the judges will ask the student questions to defend their action plan. The students will be evaluated on their answers to those questions, their presentation skills, and on the quality of their recommendations. They will also be judged on the case they make for how their action plan will benefit the business and increase its resiliency to the external factors most threatening its long-term success. A reminder that even though the students can't see or hear all of you out there watching, you can still cheer them on and applaud them in this virtual space. If you feel so inspired, feel free to use the chat feature to share your support and accolades. But please wait to do so until after the student has finished their Q&A with the judges so as not to distract them with notifications popping up during their presentation. After the final presentation, the judges will go to a private Zoom space to select the student who will be named Manomet's Next Generation Scholar for 2022 and win a $1,000 scholarship, along with our first and second runners up who will receive $500 and $250 scholarships respectively. While the judges are deliberating, you'll have the opportunity to meet most of the class of 2022 as all of our students introduce themselves to you and share what they've learned this year about how to affect environmental and social change. Then around 545, our winner will be announced and if any of you in the audience would like to talk with our students or myself after the event ends, please stick around after my closing remarks and we will enable your audio. Now, before I introduce the first student presenter, I want to say how impressive, passionate, and knowledgeable all of the students are that I had the privilege of working with this year. I'd like you all to take a second and think about yourself at their age and ask yourself, could you have ever called up business owners and interviewed them? And could you have done what our three finalists are about to do? The confidence and humility they've gained and the personal growth I've witnessed them experience is quite astonishing and incredibly inspiring. And I can't talk about how proud I am of this year's class without mentioning something that happened this spring semester. On the first day of the U360 internship every year, I promised my students that two of the many skills that they'll develop are adaptability and perseverance. For the first few years of the program, the primary way that students gained those skills was through the unpredictability that comes from engaging with busy small business owners and doing whatever you can to accommodate their needs and schedule. Then for the previous two U360 classes, on top of learning those skills through small business engagement, they also learned it through navigating the turmoil, chaos, and stress of COVID, both with the myriad ways it impacted their educational experience and personal lives, but also by trying to correspond with and interview small businesses that were being deeply impacted by the pandemic. For this year's class, all of those things were still the case for them too, but then they had a third way of developing adaptab adaptability and perseverance that I never could have anticipated. In early February, I had a sudden personal tragedy happen in my life that resulted in me taking a lengthy leave from work with no advance notice. My colleagues, Molly Jacobs, who opened our event, and Claire Capella, our U360 program assistant, 
immediately jumped into gear to take over my responsibilities and my role with the students. To keep the program running smoothly and to ensure that the students' experiences could continue seamlessly and not be compromised. Something I would like to publicly thank both of them for, along with thanking several of my other colleagues who contributed to the students' educational experience this semester by teaching them about their areas of expertise. And despite this incredibly unexpected disruption and losing the mentor they've been working with all year, the students you'll meet today kept showing up, kept pushing themselves to learn and grow, kept giving full effort to this program, and they kept seeking to understand how they can make the world a better place. They also sent me messages of love, kindness, and support, and they collaborated on giving me one of the most thoughtful, meaningful, and cherished gifts I've ever received. They are truly amazing. I was determined to return in time to teach them how to create their final projects, to coach them through the process, and to be here today to celebrate all of their hard work. And I could not be more grateful for the time we've spent together during this last phase of the program, more proud of all they've accomplished this year in the face of countless challenges and so much adversity, or more excited to shine a huge spotlight today on these remarkable young adults. To all of the parents of my students out there in the audience, please know that you have raised extraordinary human beings, every single one of them. And for those of you who are not their parents, please take my word for it. This generation has maturity, empathy, compassion, determination, and a commitment to create positive change that is truly unparalleled. Trust me when I say that our future will be in excellent hands as they start to take the reins. It's been a true honor teaching and mentoring these students this year, and it is my pleasure to welcome them to the ever-growing community of incredible young change makers that is the U360 alumni group. You'll have a chance to meet all of them shortly, but first we have a con competition to conduct. A business competition, I might add, with the three competitors being three women in STEM disciplines. So how awesome is that? Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Anika Majid. Anika was a junior this year at Stony Brook University in New York, where she is majoring in chemical and, mo and molecular engineering with a specialization in sustainability. She is from Bellport, New York, and this spring, Anika's chosen focus was businesses in the manufacturing sector. Her dream career is to work for a sustainable manufacturer to help make daily consumer products more sustainable. And here's a video of Anika back in September sharing what she was most excited about as an incoming U360 intern. Hi, my name is Anika Majid. I am a junior at Stony Brook University where I study chemical and molecular engineering with a specialization in sustainability. I live in Belport, New York, but today I'm coming to you from Pakistan. I'm really excited to gain hard sustainability skills and learn how those can be applied to small businesses. All right, and now Anika will present her sustainability action plan for a metal arts company in the Midwest. Thank you, Laura. This manufacturer has been in operation for over 110 years and has approximately 80 employees. They specialize in manufacturing metal products with raised decorative art. Think of the metal cookie tin that eventually turns into a sewing kit. The business is at the beginning of the supply chain, making metal packaging that travels to manufacturers that put their products in this packaging. The packaged products are then sent to distributors that bring it to retailers who make it available to consumers. The company has expertise in manufacturing products for industries in food and beverage, decor, entertainment, and health and beauty. Their target customers are businesses seeking customized metal printing, such as a cookie company looking for metal tins to package their cookies in. Currently, this business has many strengths. They are committed to clean, sustainable manufacturing and their metal products are 100% recyclable. 
The company also offers great employee benefits, such as paid time off and a retirement plan with partial employer contributions. This business faces competition. Although they're one of the best known companies for metal production and packaging, they are competing with businesses that manufacture other forms of packaging, specifically lightweight and easily disposable, such as plastic and paper cardboard. Research shows a rising demand for sustainable packaging, with 67% of the American consumer preferring paper and cardboard over other packaging materials. This leads consumer product businesses to consider which packaging will be more attractive, creating competition within companies that offer sustainable packaging. The changes I will recommend can help this business have better marketing, attract new customers, gain green certification, cut costs, and strengthen their workforce, which will all allow them to better face competition. This company's website shares their rich history, manufacturing abilities, and visual examples of their work. Although the website has a lot to offer, it can be structured in a more organized manner, specifically their Our Work page. This page is currently sorted by industries the business has served. However, some sections overlap, which can confuse the viewer. I recommend this business sort their Our Work page in chronological order. The different sections that are currently dedicated to individual industries can be changed to timestamps, and the products can be sorted by the year they were produced. Chronological order can help the company be more resilient to competition because they can visualize their history and the century of expertise they have, which their competitors may not. The nature of this manufacturer serving a small number of companies dictates who their customers are. They can grow their customer base by taking advantage of the rising demand for sustainable packaging, especially by younger generations. As the end user of most of their current products is the everyday consumer, the business can make packaging for companies that serve specifically the younger generations, such as skincare. They can gain these new clients by attending trade shows dedicated explicitly to packaging, gaining face-to-face -face time with a motivated audience. Trade shows are the second largest source of business-to-business -business revenue in the US, with 38% of attendees visiting a company's website after attending their booth. Gaining customers through trade shows can be another source of revenue for the manufacturer, helping them in the face of competition. The company currently offers their employees great benefits. They can continue to build a strong workforce by fostering employee creativity. The manufacturing director expressed the nature of their business no longer has much room for direct employee creativity. However, creativity does not have to come in the form of workers coming up with new product designs. Creativity can be fostered by reframing the existing monthly meetings to be more discussion-based, with employees reflecting on potential new target customers, where to find these customers and new product lines. Discussing how the company can potentially grow can allow employees to bond with each other and create an environment for a flow of ideas. Implementing employee creativity can allow the business to be more resilient to competition by knitting the workers closer and ensuring proper internal functioning. This business is committed to green sustainable manufacturing, but does not have any green certifications. A green certification is an independent validation of a company's compliance to a set of voluntary environmental or energy efficient standards. I recommend the business get ISO 14001 certified. This is an internationally agreed upon standard that sets out the requirements for an environmental management system or EMS. EMS is a set of processes and practices that allow an organization to manage their environmental responsibilities through more efficient use of resources and reduction of waste. Studies have shown businesses with this certification can gain between 0.5 to 4% of their annual sales revenue. 
As a multi-million dollar company, the certification can help the manufacturer add at least half a million dollars a year to their revenue. There are various other areas the certification has proven to result in savings. Obtaining a green certification will give this manufacturer a competitive advantage because their green standards will be passed on through the supply chain. This company currently uses paper for invoicing documents. Research shows the average cost of a paper invoice can range from $12 to $30. This is due to the supplies, time, manual labor, and storage space needed for physical invoices. Theoretically, if this business sends 10 physical invoices a month, they could be spending anywhere between $120 to $300 on invoicing costs. I recommend the company save this money by moving to a paperless invoicing system, helping them save at least $1,440 a year. There are various other benefits of this, such as increased payment speed as electronic bills lead to faster payments, which can ultimately cut down costs related to resending paper invoices. Reducing paper can help the company better face competition by increasing efficiency and saving money that can be allocated elsewhere, like green certifications. While this manufacturer can benefit from all five of my recommendations, there are two I believe they can especially benefit from. Implementing paperless invoicing can help the business promote themselves as more efficient to their customers. By sending bills electronically, the business will save money and so will their customers by eliminating the back and forth on billing through mail. The money saved from reducing paper can be used towards getting ISO 14001 certified. Since the business already has an ISO management certification, they understand the process and value of being ISO certified. This new certification can be a marketing opportunity for the business to highlight their sustainable values that can be embedded into every business that buys from this manufacturer. In the face of competition, reducing their own carbon footprint and their customers can become a reason for businesses to choose this manufacturer. With my two prioritized recommendations, this manufacturer can directly save money and market themselves as a sustainable brand. As an official sustainable manufacturer, they can become more attractive to new customers. Employees can come up with new creative solutions on where to attract these new customers and what product lines to offer. This will all enable the company to build internal robustness, allowing them to better face competition. Thank you for your time and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Anika, that was incredible. Thank um, you. Lauren here. Um, I would love to hear just a bit more about um, the, the details about the certifications, if you could elaborate on that. Do you have any sense of kind of the, the cost of the, the, the various kind of opportunities that would be before them in terms of these certifications? And if there's a a time frame. I don't know anything about them in terms of the kind of the plot arc of when they initiate a certification to when that would be completed and then when they would be able to kind of lean on that on the marketing front. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on, on those facets. Yes, of course. Thank you for that great question, Lauren. So this certification has three main steps. The first step is just getting ready for the certification, such as prepping for it with what I like to call study material. The second step is finding the right company to certify you. And then the third step is actually getting the certification. And each step comes with a cost. So preparing for the audit requires material that helps the company understand the certification better, train employees, risk management, et cetera. The company, as I mentioned, is already certified with an ISO management system. And I researched a study kit that offers, um, that is specifically for small businesses that are ISO certified and want to upgrade to the 14,001 certification. And this cost is roughly $700. Next, the business needs to choose the right organization to perform the audit. This, if the organization um, perform the organization that, that they picked first to perform their first ISO audit can perform 
this audit if they have the capability. And if not, I researched um, a free tool that can help them find audits. And this is the most costly um, step of the process. Since the company has roughly 80 employees, it takes them six days to perform this audit. And each day is $1,500, which comes out to roughly $9,000. Um, but as you asked earlier, the time process isn't the main time that it requires to get the audit done. It's to really prep for the audit, know everything so that when the audit person comes in, they're aware of how to take the test. And um, because of all this cost, it comes out to be roughly $10,000 to get the cost of the certification. The certification expires every three years and it must be renewed again through an audit. Thank you so much. Of course. Thanks, Anika. What a fantastic presentation. It's clear you, you really um, took a lot of time to research those opportunities for this company and to, to prepare yourself too for some follow-on questions. So um, to, to go off of what Lauren was saying about the ISO certification, and recognizing those costs. Did you also look into the benefits of, um, or I should say the indirect benefits of conducting these audits and how they could position the company for um, other areas of success or efficiencies? Yes, thank you so much for that question. That is a great question. There are so many benefits for this ISO 14001 certification. I will begin with a benefit that I think this company can really thrive off is that um, with this certification, they are more likely to gain new contracts. According to a survey conducted by the British Assessment Bureau, the ISO 14001 standards have a positive effect on business competitiveness. And since this business is competing with these other manufacturers that packet, uh, that manufacture packaging, it will be essential to them. And according to this study, 66% of companies using ISO 14001 standards have either directly gotten contracts due to the certification or have qualified due to their new standards for a contract. And that is just one um, benefit that they will have. There are various other benefits that I have found. There have been case studies showing that with ISO 14001 certification, companies can report savings on energy costs for fuel and general utilities, material use, and legal compliance. That's excellent. And if I don't, if I can have a, just a follow on question, did you have a um, sense or did, do any of the research which would indicate how many of their direct competitors have this, the ISO 14001 certification? That's also a great question. Although I didn't do the research to see which of their competitors would have the ISO 14001 certification, because that is a very niche certification, I did look into what kind of green certifications they have. As I mentioned in my external threat, the business is competing with other forms of packaging companies, especially plastic and paper cardboard. When I say plastic, I mean to highlight uh, biodegradable plastic plastic that's being manufactured with these new technologies. And a lot of these plastic companies do have green certifications and not just one, many. With cardboard and paper companies, they also have various green certifications. They also have the logos that come with certifications so that customers don't even have to read about the certifications, they can just identify it with the logo. Hi, Nikua. <clears throat> Great presentation. Um, <clears throat> Follow-up kind of question, kind of tying in the green certification um, to also your other, your other recommendations on the marketing plan, as well as bringing in new customers to trade shows. Given the, what seems like a pretty high price tag to get uh, green certification, um, you know, it sounds like they're already pretty um, sustainable with 100% recyclable materials. So I was just wondering if you factored in the cost um, and how it might be cheaper going to per se trade shows um, or focusing on the website first. 
Yeah, that's a great question, Nick. So to directly answer with the trade shows versus the green certification, I gave this a lot of thought. And although initially it seems like trade shows would be much more feasible and cheaper to attend, thinking it through, there's the cost to get to the trade shows, the hotel, you have to spend time and energy creating the poster. And if the workers are not working, you have to pay the workers creating this poster. Also, if the workers are taking time off to go to the trade shows, they are losing production hours. So although it may not have a lot of direct costs, there are a lot of indirect costs that come with this going to the trade show. And to go back to the website, the website is very hand in hand with the trade shows, especially attracting the new customers. Because their current customers already know what the manufacturer has to offer, visiting the website that's revamped isn't gonna necessarily offer them something new. So this revamp on the website is meant specifically for these new customers that are trying to understand what the company does better. Before, I think the, uh, the manufacturer rec prioritized revamping their website, they should consider how to get these new customers, where to get these new customers. And although trade show is one possibility, it is something that they can discuss about in those monthly meetings with the employee creativity that I mentioned, because it has to be niche and something that the employees and the entire company can agree upon, because not only one person attends the trade shows. And I just wanted to add one more thing with the ISO certification. So the business already has one ISO certification. The company has already gone through the process of it. And like the trade shows, it's not a one man job. Because the company already has expertise in this, they are more likely to want to do something that they already have experience with. Whereas something new, they may want to voice their opinion first, or maybe suggest another way that they can attract new customers. Awesome, thank you. It's a very thorough answer. Any other questions for me? No, I'm great. Thank you. Of course. You've done your research. I'm, I'm all good on my end. <laughs> thank you so much, Nick. And Trisha? Yes, thank you so much. Very thorough, both the presentation and the responses. Of course. Thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Hey, Anika! Hey. Great job! Hi, Anika! Yay. Yay. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Thank you, Anika. So next up, we have Anna Lofstrom. Anna just graduated from Lesley University in Massachusetts with a degree in environmental studies. She is from Halifax, Massachusetts, and this spring, Anna focused on businesses within the food system. Although she just graduated, her plan is to re return to Leslie in July, where she will be enrolled in their MBA program. And after she gets that degree, she hopes to pursue a career in sustainable business consulting. And here's Anna's video from September, right before starting her U360 internship. Hello, my name is Anna Lofstrom, and I'm a senior at Leslie University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I study environmental studies with a minor in communication and media studies. I'm from Halifax, Massachusetts, which is a small town a little south of Boston. But right now I'm in North Falmouth, Mass on Cape Cod, one of my favorite places in the world. Um, I'm most excited about U360 because I'm really looking forward to working with other students in all different majors and fields from all across the country to work on the same solution of helping businesses find more ways to be sustainable. All right, and now Anna will present her sustainability action plan for a food producer in California. 
Thank you, Laura. This business has been in operation for 10 years and offers a small range of gluten-free bread products. The products are vegan and gluten-free certified as well as yeast-free. 50% of the sales are in-store and 50% are e-commerce. The product is sold mainly in natural grocery stores on the West Coast. This business has 23 employees, is female owned, and the target customers are those with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. In 2012, when this company began operations, the gluten-free products market was valued at $4.2 billion. Today, it is expected to reach $7.1 billion by 2023. This trajectory shows the velocity in which the demand for gluten-free products has skyrocketed. This business is currently highlighting their business story and values through their website blog. They also offer interactive marketing on social media, which helps them look vibrant and intriguing to their target customers. Due to the business's size, location, and fewer years in operation, the biggest threat they face is competition. From local wholesalers and from large, well-known corporations who offer gluten-free products with a recognized name. These options are cheaper, the corporations have more capital, shelf space, and ability to market. This makes it difficult for small brands like this one to compete. For reference, Udi's gluten-free bread is sold at most chain grocery stores for $5 per loaf. This business offers a pack of three loaves for $39. This higher price point is due to the product's high quality ingredients and allergen-free labels. However, they face competition because their product also costs nearly three times more than well-known brands. The following recommendations provide ways for the business to strengthen marketing, cut costs, and retain employees, allowing them to become strong competitors in their industry. As a women-owned business looking to strengthen marketing and relate to target audiences, adding a women-owned certification and logo may offer many benefits. There is zero cost to use the logo, and business owners pay an upfront fee of only $350 to apply. Business owners benefit by differentiating themselves in the market. Buyers gain additional information about products and retailers are able to show shoppers where their values lie. Certification through Women's Business Enterprises National Council also connects you to networks, opportunities, and resources. Businesses gain access to mentoring, education, and development. They also have the opportunity to connect with other women-owned businesses. Becoming certified women-owned provides great marketing and allows internal development as well. Collaboration and promotion is an option this business may consider. Tabling at a local grocery store may help attract new customers. Because it is a costly product, many may want to sample before buying, especially a gluten-free product due to its distinct texture and flavor. Tabling can offer benefits such as strong marketing and increased competitive advantage. Working with nano influencers, which are individuals with an audience of less than 5,000 followers on social media may benefit this business. Nano influencers have a very close relationship with their followers, which means their engagement rate is much higher than those with millions of followers. This collaboration could help brand advertisement and search engine optimization. Nano influencers are the ideal ambassadors for the brands that want to address their target audience in a personalized way. The food industry is highly water intensive. To save money, this business may consider purchasing faucet aerators for their kitchens. Aerators are simple, inexpensive nozzles that screw easily onto sink faucets to cut water use and can be purchased online or in hardware stores. The EPA says switching from an aerator that releases 2.2 gallons per minute with one that releases 1.5 gallons per minute can reduce water use by 30% without reducing performance. The average cost of aerators is five to $15. This business would need to purchase 11 aerators, which would cost them around $75.
This business used 157,000 gallons of water in 2021. This cost them around $31,000 at the rate of 20 cents a gallon. While a portion of that water is used for making the dough itself, and those numbers won't be altered by the aerators, the excess water used for cleaning and sanitation can be cut drastically, saving the business money. Even reducing the small amount of 5,000 gallons of water with these aerators would save the business a quick $300. This recommendation would result in a positive return on investment. I recommend this business become 1% for the planet certified. This certification is given to businesses that meet a high bar commitment by donating 1% of their annual sales to environmental causes. Implementing this logo requires a $200 activation fee and low yearly membership fees. This organization was founded in 2002 with the mission of preventing greenwashing by providing charitable giving opportunities for businesses. Focusing on community-based marketing with this logo would provide strong competitive advantage. This logo becoming more steadily recognized by consumers would set them apart. As a member company, you can also choose which organizations you want to support, which creates transparency and shows commitment to the environment. This recommendation is low cost as well as easy to implement. Employee satisfaction is likely to lead to lesser turnover and absenteeism. This business deals with high turnover, so saving money by retaining employees will help them increase their capital and competitive advantage. A longer term option this business may consider is creating a 401k for employees with a 50% match. There is a one-time startup fee between $500 to $1,500 to start a retirement plan. Research shows that offering a retirement plan is likely to strengthen your workforce and retain employees in the long term. The cost of turnover is extremely high. It's estimated that losing an employee can cost a company 1.5 to two times the employee's salary. For this business, the average salaried worker makes $58,000 a year. Offering a 50% match 401k with employee contribution of up to 4% would end up costing just one third of losing only one employee each year. This would allow the business to save almost $60,000 a year. Investing in this option would allow them to become a strong competitor for employment in their area. Retaining a strong workforce is vital to being a fierce competitor in any industry. Though this business may benefit from all five of the previous recommendations, the following two are the most beneficial. Purchasing and installing faucet aerators may highly benefit this business. With only a $75 upfront investment, this business could see cost savings almost immediately. Because they are located in a drought-stricken state and their product and industry are highly water intensive, cutting water use is crucial. If the business is using around 5,000 gallons of water per month for cleaning and sanitation, this would normally cost them $1,000. Within a month of purchasing aerators with a 30% reduction in water use, they could save $300. This recommendation is also very easy to implement with aerators being extremely simple to install. By cutting costs this drastically each month, this option would help tighten the business's capital, providing direct competitive advantage. Because the business owner expressed dealing with high turnover, retaining employees is key to success. A Glassdoor survey revealed that four in five employees would prefer new or additional benefits over a pay raise. 89% of younger employees, those between 18 and 34, would prefer benefits such as a retirement plan to more money in their paycheck. Employees who feel their employer is invested in them are more likely to be engaged in their workplace. The average age of employees at this business is 35 years old, which also means that offering benefits is likely to incentivize employees to stay with the company longer. Because this business already offers competitive health benefits, providing an option for savings would be beneficial. Research shows savings for the future is more important to employed people after age 31. This option would offer many benefits, including a positive return on investment. With the combination of these recommendations, the internal challenges and external threats can be managed and adapted to in the face of competition. 
My two prioritized recommendations are the most feasible in terms of financial cost and timeliness. These recommendations focus on internal ways to retain employees and reduce water use, as well as external ways to manage marketing and sustain target audiences. This sustainability action plan offers ways for the business to cut costs, retain employees, and gain competitive advantage. This will allow them to become strong contenders in a fiercely competitive industry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you want to hop in, Trisha? No, you can go for it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Go Leslie, by the way. Um, Thank you. <laughs> that's great. Um, really interesting subject for me as, as somebody who is vegetarian, leans, vegan. So I was very curious about this company that you, you studied so deeply. Um, I loved a lot of the recommendations, the 1% for the planet. Reverb is a 1% for the planet nonprofit recipient, and we know a good deal about them. They're wonderful. Um, the question I had was kind of about their you know, external threat, kind of existential question for them, which to me was really about the, the pricing being kind of their, their biggest issue. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more about um, you know, your thoughts about that. Did you, you know, do any other research around that? If, if Udi's is a competitive brand and it's three times less expensive, you know, that, that hurdle to me was the thing that kind of jumped out to me the most. You know, there are some sustainability measures that are key, but I think without potentially some innovative marketing, like you suggested with influencers and 1% um, for the planet, some of that branding, that that price point might be the bigger sticking point. So I shouldn't know if you had any other um, thoughts about that aspect of um, that external threat. Yes, definitely. Thank you for the question. Um, so I think when I started doing my research, that was also something I was a little shocked by was just the price difference. Um, I was gluten-free for a while as well. So looking for those options was always difficult to find the ones that were going to actually taste good. Um, and Udi's is one that I have tried before and they are much cheaper. The thing that I noticed was with all of this company's um, labels, they're vegan, gluten-free certified, kosher. They have a lot of certifications in this area for being an allergen-free product, yeast-free as well. Um, that comes with a lot of extra costs. So having to have your kitchens be up to speed on all of these um, cleanliness measures and sanitation practices just to follow along with these guidelines um, is extremely expensive and as well as they're also a smaller business. So I think that's where the price point mainly comes from is just the, the not the struggle, but the um, having to deal with those barriers as well of being um, so many allergen free certifications. So I think that's where the, yeah, where the price point is coming from. Thank you. Thank you. And that was such a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and really interesting perspective that you took. I think um, I really appreciated about the presentation about your approach was really exploring the investments in the company that could, could yield um, rewards down the road, particularly when you're looking at the employee benefits and how that can reduce the staff turnover employee turnover. So my question for you is, um, you know, outside of the uh, employee benefits that you outlined there, were there any other areas that you felt that um, you look or that you looked at, um, particularly when it came to turnover rates or creating a company culture that would retain or attract more talent um, that you either, you know, decided not to go against or posed, um, you know, equal threat to the company or equal opportunity to the company? And Yes, definitely. So I think, thank you for the question. I think um, something that I was noticing with their company was that I felt like the company culture was actually really strong. They have a lot of work on their social media platforms with um, highlighting employees, doing employee of the month, sharing about, about their, their staff and their team. They also have an extensive place on their website to share more about the people on their team and who's involved with photos and everything like that. Um, so I think that 
going with the retirement plan, I had looked into what they offer for um, health benefits and medical benefits. And because those were already, I felt like extremely competitive. I thought that going with the retirement plan option, especially given the age of their employees, um, being that median 35 years old age was really beneficial of having an option, especially because compared to other competitors in the area, they are one of the few that don't offer a retirement plan yet. Um, so that's why I did decide to go with that one. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, so you had made, I think, one, one of your recommendations on the faucet aerators um, involving water usage. Um, and then a lot of your other recommendations were, um, you know, marketing, um, employee base. And I was just curious if there was any other things that came in conversation in terms of their environmental practices and things that they could potentially be doing better, um, both cheaper and, uh, you know, more sustainably. Yes, definitely. Thank you for the question. So I think when I was looking into their environmental practices initially, they are doing things in their warehouses and in their production kitchens with recycling, um, trying to cut down on how much you know paper they're using. Their products are also pretty sustainably packaged um, compared to other breads. They're not wrapped in um, plastic. They're actually sort of a cardboard bag um, just a different way of looking at sustainable packaging for their company. So I felt like the biggest um, threat was actually just the drought um, and how they're located in this area that's dealing with um, so much drought. And that's why I had focused on the aerators um, as, as their environmental recommendation. Um, their drought in California actually is now identified as moderate drought, gripping 85% of California. Um, and every almost every corner of the state is being affected. So around 37 million people in California are affected by the drought, which accounts for 95% of the total population. So when looking at how inten uh, water intensive the product itself actually is of producing um, gluten-free bread, and then also just how water intensive the food industry is with cleaning and sanitation, and then also looking at how, how the measures that they're held to for their allergen-free kitchens of having to be so sanitized and cleaned at all times, um, cutting down on water use, I felt like was the most beneficial way of starting with, um, because they were already focusing on things like recycling and sustainable packaging, that this was very clearly to me the next step. Absolutely. Yeah, no, sounds like a great, easy fix. Um, and then kind of following up from Lauren and Trisha's uh, questions, I think you um, alluded to a great point with the retirement plan and, and the average age um, of the employees at the company. Um, but, you know, thinking of this size, you know, 23 employees, pretty small, um, obviously savings down the road, but potentially upfront um, kind of cost in the onset. Do you foresee potentially that, you know, the Kind of marketing route and you know working with the influencers going into the grocery stores you know bringing maybe younger employees on board um, could also be a good route to go yes definitely thank you for that question so when i was focusing on the prioritized recommendations something that i was obviously noticing was just the marketing strategy and needing to have more people involved, like you said, with the nano influencers, having that route of connecting with um, either people that are having gluten-free gluten -free blogs or things like that to connect with, to be able to market the product better is definitely a great way to um, gain more customers and that sort of thing. Um, because I prioritized the retirement plan, the reason I did so was because of, based on the other companies in the area, they were one of the only ones who didn't offer this. So I felt like speaking a little bit bluntly um, without the workers that they need to be able to produce the actual product and deliver the product and distribute it through all of those phases, I felt like the product itself and marketing the product was almost the next step. So you kind of need the team first um, to be able to stay and have people that want to stay with the company longer and creating that company culture. Um, should come first. So offering this benefit of the retirement plan, I felt like would be beneficial over marketing first. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.
any other questions. Well, that's great. Thank you for those explanations. Really thorough. Very thorough. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anna. All right. So now, last but not least, our third and final presenter today is Ching Yi Yi. Ching Yi was a senior this year and just graduated from Boston University with an Earth and Environmental Science degree. She's from Queens, New York, and this spring, Ching Yi interviewed all women-owned businesses. Now that she has graduated, she's seeking a job that will allow her to connect with people and work on projects that positively affect her community. And here's Ching Yi back in September, sharing what she was looking forward to in the coming U360 year. My name is Chingy and I am from Queens, New York. I am currently a senior studying environmental science at Boston University. I look forward to meeting all the other U360 interns as well as getting to know my team better throughout the semester. I also look forward to challenging myself to interview different businesses across the country. All right, so I would like to welcome to the, the screen Chingy. And now she will present her sustainability action plan for a construction company in New Jersey. Thank you, Laura. This business uses proprietary technology to provide for a faster and more convenient solution to restoring dilapidated roads and paving potholes. It is woman owned and has been in operation for about 20 years. Today, the business serves mainly to gas and water utilities, as well as municipalities. The business currently has a total of 52 employees and it's located in a suburban area next to many contractors, manufacturers, and suppliers. Within a 10 mile radius, there are about 20 other construction and paving businesses. And within the state, there are about eight others that provide the same technology. The business is one of the first to brand its asphalt paving services in the state, making it recognizable to its customers. It projects itself to double in size in the next five years and hopes to strengthen its presence in both its state and industry. The business holds many strengths. Their office is environmentally conscious, they recycle 100% of their office supplies, and their air and heating system is digitally monitored. There is a strong emphasis on providing employees with formal and informal feedback, and the business also focuses on fostering diversity and good culture. Seeing how the company is surrounded by multiple businesses in the same industry and many offering similar technology and services, the business faces strong competition. The business also experiences high turnover rates exacerbated by a severe labor shortage due to COVID-19 and inflation. According to McKinsey and Company, construction wages increased by 7.9% from 2019-2021, resulting in a more competitive market. In 2020, more than 3.2 workers from the baby boomer generation retired as a result of the pandemic. However, the younger generation failed to fill the gap due to a greater demand for better working conditions and benefits beyond competitive pay, resulting in a mismatch in labor and demand. When facing competition, the business can benefit from solutions to help them save money in operations, retain talent, and develop stronger relationships with their workforce and clients. The business offers a six-month internship program for college students to work on their social, and me social media and promotion team. And I consider expanding this effort to provide, an to provide an apprenticeship program for those who do not hold degrees, but possess technical skills and hands-on experience needed for the construction jobs. Within a 10 mile radius, there are about 10 colleges and vocational schools that business can partner up with to keep their talents local and bring in a stream of younger workers. For example, the business can sign up for career fairs at community colleges or speak in classes to increase awareness of work opportunities in construction. This way, the business will be diversifying their recruitment process and more likely to attract employees of various backgrounds and experiences. Efforts to keep employees local and diverse help to reduce turnover rate and save the company money and time in the hiring process. The business currently operates 15 diesel fuel vehicles with increased volatility in oil prices, as we are all aware of to, due to current global events, it would be beneficial for the business to look into alternatives. The business can consider switching to biodiesel instead. It is a biodegradable fuel that is manufactured from vegetable oil or animal fat. It can come in multiple forms, most commonly, most common being B20, meaning that the fuel is six to 20% biodiesel. 
While the price of biodiesel is comparable to that of diesel, as we can see from the graph, it can still bring the business, help the business combat the threat of competition. Instead of going to fueling stations, the business can apply for time biodiesel delivery from a local company, helping them save time. This is plausible since the business has a relatively large fleet, each vehicle with a tank capacity of 50 to 100 gallons. Biodiesel is a more reliable source of fuel since it is domestically sourced and also generates lower emissions as some is offset by agriculture. The business can advertise these positive attributes on their website and fleets to gain a greater competitive edge through, high, for example, through higher search engine optimization ranking and stronger brand awareness. Biodiesel also helps to extend engine life and increase engine efficiency. This will slow down the wearing of engine parts. In addition, it is safer to work with because it is less likely to combust. As a more reliable source of fuel with numerous em environmental benefits, biodiesel can bring lots of social environmental values to the business, helping it become more competitive and attractive to clients. The business plans to install hands-free sinks and toilets in its six bathrooms. However, instead of hands-free sinks, the business might consider dual flush toilets. Hands-free toilets, the business might consider dual flush toilets, which offers a low flush option. While automatic toilets are hygienic and convenient, they may be troublesome in the long run. We have all experienced the issue of a phantom flush, where the toilet flushes before we enter and after we exit the bathroom. These flushes can accumulate quickly into extra gallons of water. An American standard dual flush toilet costs about $230 and offers a low flush option of 0.92 gallon per flush. A motion sensing toilet of the same brand costs $290 and uses 1.28 gallon per flush. Data from the World Population Review reports that on a 100 gallon per person per day basis in New Jersey, the average water price is about 16 cents per gallon. The dual flush option helps a business save about $60 per unit and on top of that, if every employee flushes the toilet three times a day, totaling 156 flushes, the business can save up to $9 per day and 56 gallons of water. In the face of competition, this helps the business reduce its expenses as well as becoming more sustainable. The business currently gets its municipality and utility clients through a bidding process. It is often long and strenuous and new bids can be difficult for a growing small business. The business may benefit from branching into more commercial clients and implementing a referral program. The business's main service area is currently about one hour away and it's from its warehouse, making the jobs long and fuel intensive. The business can tap into a new source of revenue by partnering with businesses in its area. For example, if a real estate company uses one of the local suppliers for materials, the business can give the real estate company a discount if they also use the paving business for their driveways. There are also big residential areas that business can expand to and implement a referral program to give discounts to repeating clients. By expanding into the commercial sector, the business can rely less on bids. Local jobs will also be faster and less fuel intensive, helping the business save time and money. The business is active on Facebook and Instagram. While this is good for building, building online exposure, clients are more likely to interact with the business's official website. In addition, Facebook and Instagram target mostly younger individuals and are not conducive for building relationships with clients. The business can consider writing and sending out email newsletters twice a month. Newsletters can be an extremely useful marketing strategy to help a business strengthen its branding. They are easy to monitor and a great way to consolidate all information related to the business, such as job opportunities and events. One marketing tool the business can look into is Constant Contact. It provides very simple, quick, and easy to use templates, which reduces the learning curve. The business can even have its marketing intern, as, pre as mentioned previously, to do research on best practices and devise further recommendations for how to approach a newsletter for the company. Newsletters give the business a marketing advantage by helping to build a stronger client community and improve the company brand. As the business is in the process of renovating some of its water technologies, considering dual flush toilets would be most important and relevant. Not only can the business save money, but they will also be immensely reducing their environmental impact. If employees are in the office five days a week, the business can save up to $270 and 1,680 gallons of water per month. Switching to biodiesel is something the business can strongly consider, even with prices being comparable to that of diesel. Biodiesel can bring a lot more additional benefits to the business and environment, such as saving time on fueling, lower emissions, and greater marketing advantages. These two suggestions can help the business reduce its spending and improve environmental sustainability. By reducing expenses and improving the brand image, this allows the company to potentially allot funds to expand the workforce and its operations and help, and help attract more clients.
As the business plans to grow and double in size in the next five years, it is crucial to identify new ways of expanding both its client pool as well as hiring long-term employees. This will reduce the threat of competition and help the business retain talent and save money. In addition, as global warming becomes a more imminent threat, it's important for the business to look at ways to reduce their dependency on non-renewable fuels. This paving business has been in the industry for 20 years and has made an incredible impact on its community. These recommendations can increase the longevity of the business by helping them save money, attract new talent and clients, and become more competitive. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a fantastic presentation, real, real thorough. And I really enjoyed how you had a varied um, list of recommendations. Um, so in one of your, your um, selected recommendations to, to highlight about uh, working with the fleet to replace with biofuel, question for you, because this is a space that I know we work in very often, um, is why not electrify the fleet and what type of um, impact, you know, when we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, where, how much did that play into the consideration of this recommendation? And could that help actually support this recommendation in terms of what their impact and savings would be to prepare them to be more um, sustainable when it comes to their emissions and carbon footprint? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I decided to choose biodiesel because it is more readily available for their fleet since they already run on diesel. Um, as long as they use B20 or lower, there isn't much that they have to do to the fleet um, themselves to for it to use biodiesel. So that transition would be more seamless than going, let's say, electrical. And they would also be having to like do extra research on how to replace those vehicles and uh, run electrically. Um, and as for the actual emissions. Um, I researched on the biodiesel.org. I'm just referring to my notes. It is about 188 um, pounds of um, CO2 emissions um, that do not go into the, that do not stay in the atmosphere for every 50 gallons of um, fuel that they use. Um, and in addition to that, if they choose to research into um, greater uh, levels of biodiesel, they would also be reducing more um, carbon emissions. And that's not only to carbon, for example, um, other pollutants such as um, part, um, PM, PM 2.5 and things like that. Thank you, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I've done a lot of biodiesel fuelings for some of the uh, artists that we've worked with and have you know, worked with suppliers all over the country. And I know it's a, it's a great thing to support. And there is some really great domestic um, uh, post-consumer oil biodiesel that is, uh, that is used out there. So it's really very cool. Um, I love that. And then it felt like the, yeah, the water was a very kind of low hanging fruit, um, the water reduction piece. Um, my question was around some of the kind of promotional marketing development. And if you, if you could create a newsletter or an email plan, you know, knowing that this is a construction company in New Jersey that um, that works in in a, in a very specific niche, it seems, you know, how would you talk to a wider audience around that sort of company um, and, and kind of make that enticing to potentially bring in new recruits as staff or um, new clients? And I was just wanting to hear more about your thoughts there. Yeah, thank you. Um, the business actually already has a lot of information on their website, for example, news articles that they um, are featured in, as well as conferences that they attend and some of their community initiatives, such as serving on boards and um, doing community related events. And with the newsletters, what I recommend is that the newsletter can help them consolidate all of that information. Um, and if you interact with a client, you're most likely having, going to have their email, phone number, and things like that. And as I mentioned, Instagram and um, Facebook, it's still mainly for you to just get updates, but you don't, as a client, you might not check it um, as often. And so having a newsletter, you're, sent, you're actively engaging with the customer and client rather than having them go on your specific websites and look at all those pieces of information from different um, areas. And so having to consolidate that, and for example, I um, recommended that they do it first for two times a month. Um, that is one of the best practices that I researched. 
Um, and I think for now, it would be good for them to just send it out to their um, existing clients and also any organization that, I, that they're part of or when they are um, advertising to schools, they can also ask schools to send out those emails. I know from my school, like my coordinator, she is sending out emails from companies all the time. So that is a really easy and simple way for them to get their name out there. Great, thank you. Hi, Xingyi, great presentation. Um, my question was around, um, you know, you kind of posed the big threat as, uh, you know, competition, but also, you know, labor shortages um, and the need need for workers, um, you know, why, why wouldn't you prioritize potentially the apprenticeship program as I feel like that takes on that threat head on? Mm -hmm. Yes, I um, definitely think agree. I agree with that. Um, but I think one, the, the as Lauren mentioned, um, the water saving technology for the, the toilet is the low, low hanging fruit. Um, as for recruiting um, new employees, like you, it would require more time and more um, people. So right now I am not too sure if the company has enough people. Of course they can have their interns and also some people on their marketing team to do that. Um, but also Biodiesel will also be helping them advertise their company more rather than um, expanding. So right, the in phase of competition, you do want to expand, but you also do want to focus more on how can you protect your company and make it more sustainable. So those two prioritized um, recommendations uh, focus more on that. So yeah, and with biodiesel, you can, as I mentioned before, the, the trajectory for biodiesel is that we are producing more and it's a $12 billion industry. And so we're seeing that, you know, we are turning to more renewable sources of energy. So that's why I prioritize this too. Great. And did you happen to look into the cost of um, kind of implementing an appren apprenticeship program? Um, that I have not, but it would be a good idea to look into that and how, like, how many people you need that and what time, like the timeline of recruitment and what kind of like materials you have to prepare. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? <laughs> I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for your thorough responses. Thank you. All right. So uh, now that you've seen these three presentations, I'll share that the students only had five weeks to put their projects together and their action plan was based on just a one hour conversation with the business owner, along with a lot of research as you just saw. So let's have another round of applause please for our three students who all did such an excellent job. Yay, everybody. <laughs> And I also wanna say thank you again to Lauren, Trisha, and Nick for being such great judges. I definitely don't envy the task that's in front of you right now. Um, and at this time, we're going to say goodbye to you. So our judges will be leaving to go to a private breakout room where they'll deliberate and determine this year's winner. So thank you all, the three of you, and we'll see you soon. See you soon. Thank you. Right. Okay, so in the meantime, while we await their decision, you'll have the opportunity to hear from most of the students in this year's U360 class. But first, I have some thank yous to extend to several people. All right. To begin with, I would like to express my utmost appreciation to our team of preliminary judges who gave the invaluable gift of their time and expertise last week as they viewed, evaluated, and scored the students' presentations. Some of the judges are also U360 alumni who are out of school and are now business and or sustainability professionals. And you can see which U360 class they were a part of on this slide. So I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Alex Savage of Guest Worldwide, Amy Hatton from Thornton Tomasetti, Andrea O'Brien from the New Hampshire Small Business Development Center, Brad Pierce of Seed Strategies, 
Christopher Murphy of Fidelity Investments, Gabrielle Melchionda from Mad Gabs, Kate Holcomb from Canopy Farms, Carrie Sands from College of the Atlantic, Carrie Strout Grantham from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Leah McLeod from UNAM, Leah Soloway from the New England Environmental Finance Center, Leah Barubi from the Solana Center for Environmental Innovation, Mallory Strain from the Massachusetts House of Representatives, Meredith Coffin of Springboard Pilates, and Rich Grogan from the Northern Border Regional Commission. So thank you to all of our preliminary judges. And next, I would like to thank seven extraordinary uh, individuals who are so in integral to the success and outcome of this year's internship. Every year, we have a team of alumni assistants, former U360 interns, who are invited to continue with us at Manomet as volunteer program assistants. And there aren't words to express the amount of gratitude I have for this group that I call the A-Team. These alumni are so committed to helping U360 and our interns succeed that they give countless hours of their time on top of a full course load or a full-time job to coach and mentor the current students, to assist me with various program tasks and to pr promote U360 to prospective students as we recruit the next year's class. To say they're my right-hand people would be a gross understatement and U360 would certainly be a lesser program without the time, perspective, talents and care they give to me and our students. Everyone, please join me in applauding the unsung heroes of this year's U360 internship. Thank you to Abby Novak, U360 class of 2018, Autumn Strom from the U360 class of 2020, Cynthia Criojo from the class of 2021, Desiree Dater from the class of 2021, Julia Iannuzzi from the class of 2021 also, Lily Brown, also from the class of 2021, and our reigning Next Generation Scholar, and Max Hayes from the U360 class of 2019. Thank you to all of them for everything they've done this year. And last, but certainly not least, I wanna thank all of the students in this year's class. On behalf of all of us at Manomet, thank you for your incredibly hard work, for your dedication to this program, and for your determination to be change makers. And thank you for bravely contacting small business owners to talk with them about sustainability. I know it is not easy putting yourself out there or picking up the phone to call someone you don't know, but you all did it. And because of you, over 200 small business owners had the opportunity to think about ways they could improve their overall sustainability for the first time during an ongoing pandemic when they've never needed that more. You all set the wheels in motion and your action will have rippling effects that will make the world a better place. So for that, we all thank you. And on that note, I'd like to ask the class, the U360 class of 2022 to join me now. All right, hi everyone. Hi. Okay, before we begin hearing from you all, I just wanna take a moment to recognize the members of this year's class who weren't able to be here this evening. Irene Goldwasser from Rutgers University, Jesse Huynh from George Mason University, Catherine Infantino from Baruch College, Margaret Shaw from University of Georgia, Martha McGregor from St. Michael's College, and Tani Buckaloo from University of Maine. All right, so for those of you who are here, I'd like, uh, yeah, you to take turns just going around and introducing yourself to the audience. Why don't you share your name, your hometown, the college you attend, the grade you just finished, what you're majoring in, and your spring topic. And then I'd like to hear each of your thoughts on this particular question. So I'd love to hear what you've learned this year in U360 about how to affect environmental and social change and how you think, how you think you'll apply what you've learned after leaving the program. So after you introduce yourself, you can go ahead and invite one of your fellow interns to introduce themselves next. Sound good? Yeah, all right. So let's see here. Alondra, would you like to start us off? Of course. Hi, everyone. I'm Alondra Garcia. I'm a senior at New Jersey City University. I'm majoring in marketing with a focus on digital marketing. My spring topic was focused on Latinx-owned businesses. 
And as far as our environmental and social change, I learned in U360 that no, like, no change is too small. Um, and any change that we can make to be a bit more environmentally and socially cautious is great. And the way I'll take that into my personal say the day life is by trying to have that conversation with other people because prior to the program, I was very new to sustainability. Now I'd like to invite Anna to introduce herself. Thank you, Alondra. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Lobstrom and I'm from Halifax, Massachusetts. And I'm a recent graduate of Lesley University where I majored in environmental studies. And my spring topic was the food industry. To me, um, being a part of U360 taught me how significant it is for small businesses to really work to increase sustainability um, in order to be a part of effective solutions to the climate crisis. And this program is also the reason I decided upon my path um, after graduating, and I'll be using what I learned in U360 um, as I work on my MBA this summer. And I'd like to invite Anne to go next. Thank you, Anna. Hi everyone, I'm Anne Catherine Gonzalez and I'm from Old Bridge, New Jersey. I'm a rising junior at New Jersey City University majoring in marketing and my spring topic was businesses related to the home. Um, U360 has taught me about sustainable practices that small businesses and ourselves can implement daily. This program gave me the ability to have the confidence to communicate with business owners who are complete strangers to me um, and, and be able to speak with them professionally with the knowledge of sustainability under my belt. Um, these key tools um, to send out mass emails and phone calls, as well as managing deadlines in a remote work setting are all transferable skills that have prepared me for future internships and job opportunities I'll have now and when I graduate. So now I'd like to introduce Fiona. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Fiona Leo, and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I currently attend Northeastern University as an environmental and sustainability sciences major, and I just finished my junior year. And for my spring topic, I interviewed businesses in the environmental services industry. So initially, I thought that sustainability simply involved greening businesses. And as someone interested in becoming a sustainability consultant, I learned that businesses face several forms of challenges that may result in them not prioritizing environmental sustainability. However, by recognizing how sustainability on an economic, social, and environmental scale are heavily intertwined with each other, I now have a better understanding of how to help businesses save money, make money, and reduce risks, which will all ultimately reduce their environmental impact. Now, Anika, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you so much, Fiona. Hi, everyone. My name is Anika. I go to Stony Brook University, and I'm from Belport, New York. I just finished my junior year as a chemical and molecular engineering major with a specialization in sustainability. My spring topic was all businesses in the manufacturing sector. And as for what I've learned from U360 is the importance of conversation. I've learned that whether it's environmental, social, or any type of change, it all really starts with the ability to have a conversation, whether it was our emails, our phone calls, our second emails, our second phone calls, or even our third emails, it all just required reaching out. And because of that ability to reach out and have those conversations, we were able to make change. And I hope to take this with me in my future and continue having those hard conversations. I'd like to invite my teammate, Anthony, to go next. Thank you, Anika. Hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Neary, and I'm originally from Greenwich, Connecticut. And I'm currently a senior at Boston University, graduating this August. And at BU, I study biology and environmental science. And for my spring topic, I chose to focus on businesses within the food industry. Um, during my time in U360, I've learned that sustainable changes can help businesses in a variety of ways. Um, for example, reducing a business's environmental impact could also save the business money or improve their relationship with the community. And in the future, I would like to advocate for more sustainable changes 
at the organizations I work for. Uh, Maya, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you, Anthony. Hello, everyone. My name is Maya Ackle, and I am from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I just finished my junior year at Georgetown University. I am majoring in environmental biology and am pursuing a fellowship in sustainable business. My spring topic was women-owned businesses. And through U360, I learned the ins and outs of professional communication, time management skills, and how sustainability doesn't just apply to environmental practices, but all aspects of business and industry. I plan to use all of these skills and apply them um, in my future career, which I hope to pursue ESG investment and sustainable consulting. And I would like to pass the mic to Mia now. Thank you, Maya. Hi, everyone. My name is Mia Kelly. I'm from Chelmsford, Massachusetts, and I just graduated from Boston University, where I studied international relations and environmental analysis and policy. And my spring topic was also women-owned businesses. And then something that I learned in U360, I'm going to agree with Anika, is the importance of starting and participating in difficult conversations about sustainability, specifically with people who have different opinions than me. I really believe that those difficult conversations are an underrated way to start environmental change through education. And I plan to bring that openness to conversation with me in every aspect of my life, but specifically in my career after this program. And now I'll pass it over to Ching Yi. Thank you, Mia. Um, hi, my name is Ching Yi Yi, and I'm from Queens, New York. Um, and I also recently graduated from Boston University with a degree in Earth and Environmental Science. Um, and I also did my uh, spring topic on women-owned businesses. And I will have to agree with Alondra that no change is um, too small, especially learning from Laura and um, speaking with the business owners about all the nuances and initiatives that they take to make sure that their businesses are sustainable. For example, just hiring local um, and also reducing waste from every aspect of their business operations um, and even implementing a new toilet, um, as I mentioned before. And that I want to take with me um, for my future career, my future life, and also just every little aspect um, in life about like which um, to focus on like the little decisions that I make and how they will impact the environment. And I um, would like to pass it on to Sophie. Thank you, Ching Yi. Um, my name is Sophie Shepard. I'm from Denver, Colorado, and I also go to Boston University. I just finished my junior year and I study environmental analysis and policy. And my spring topic was LGBT owned businesses. So before U360, uh, what my role should be in this environmental field with big issues like climate change really made me freeze up um, into inaction really. But U360 has taught me how collective action can really make an impact thinking about how 200 more business owners think about sustainability after our work this year. So going forward, I will look to the solution of the climate movement as not just one environmental movement, but as a collection of lots of smaller movements. So now I will pass it off to Allie. Thanks, Sophie. So like she said, my name is Allie Volmar and I am, um, I just finished my junior year at the University of Vermont and my majoring in finance and minoring in environmental studies. And my spring topic this year was infrastructure for businesses. And uh, one thing that I learned about change is that business owners and us as a U360 class must have perseverance in order to succeed in our ever-changing world. Um, and one thing I'd like to take with me after the program is to encourage others to listen to opinions that are different from theirs, um, to gain new insight that could be valuable to their life going forward. And now I'd like to open the floor to Ashley. Hello, my name is Ashley Morales and I'm from Rockland County, New York. I go to Fordham University and I just finished up my junior year. I'm an environmental studies major and this spring I also focused on women-owned businesses like many others. Um, 
Throughout this internship, I've learned that there are ways that all of us can make a difference, even without being CEOs of large corporations. Um, we can use fewer chemicals in our homes or monitor our energy or water usage. And overall, this year, U360 has given me hope for the future and for the role that I can play in making this world a more sustainable place, whether in my personal life or in any career I choose. Now I'm going to pass it over to Sean to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Carlson. I'm from Wilton, Connecticut, and I just finished my junior year at Franklin Marshall College, and I'm studying uh, business and environmental studies. And my spring topic was manufacturing and production companies. I believe that one of the biggest ways of affecting environmental and social change is through exactly what we're doing now, and that's education. Um, and that includes teaching sustainability to the younger generation, as well as uh, learning about it as a manager or a leader. Uh, the place where sustainability starts is really having these simple conversations about your own impact, and from there you can really start to affect change. Um, I hope to use my experience from this whole internship uh, very closely as I uh, move into the workforce in a year uh, where I'd really like to go into corporate social sustainability um, and responsibility, um, or even as an environmental consultant, which can be very similar to the opportunity that I was able to have here. And finally, I'd like to introduce Kenzie. Last one, I promise. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Kenzie Wookie. I'm originally from Douglasville, Pennsylvania, but I just recently graduated from the University of South Florida studying environmental science and policy. My spring topic was focused on businesses related to music as it holds a special place in my heart. And my biggest takeaway from U360 is just the term balance because Whenever I thought of environmentalism before and sustainability, it was always about like green initiatives and anything related to the physical environment. And I kind of negated the social and economic aspects of sustainability. And what U360 has really highlighted for me is that you need a balance between all three concepts to really have a well-rounded and holistic perspective of what sustainability in the workforce can be like. So going forward into my future career, as I just graduated, I'm looking to keep that perspective and hopefully translate that into whatever role role I take going forward and keeping an open mind for how sustainability manifests in a lot of different ways. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Laura. All right, thanks everybody. Um, so while we're waiting for the judges to come back, um, just for the benefit of the audience, we have a group here of, uh, yeah, the young change makers, representatives from Gen Z. So I thought we could also take a minute to hear your perspective on some of the issues facing your generation that we've been talking about. So I'm gonna focus on the climate crisis and I just have a couple questions. We'll ask as many as we have time for before the judges get back. Um, and just anybody who has any thoughts they'd like to share on this question, please chime in. So the first question I have is that, as we know, climate change has a broad range of impacts, not just on the environment, but also on our communities and human health. Um, what are your biggest concerns and what impacts of climate change are you most concerned about? Do you want to go first? Oh, is this like a raise hand kind of thing or no? Go for it, Ashley. And then Jamie. Oh, okay. um, well, but throughout my college career, I've had a really big interest in um, environmental justice and climate justice and how kind of the effects of climate change affect populations that already face oppression. Um, specifically, I've done projects on the effects of Hurricane Maria and um, a couple of other environmental justice issues. So I just think that that is at least my one of my bigger concerns as we see the effects of climate change. Following along that, I have something more specific, um, just because during school I did research on food prices and how climate change has impacted that. Um, and we're, we're still experiencing that, but I'm pretty sure you're all aware of it when we had, when COVID hit the hardest, um, prices just really soared up there. And that's really scary and, um, for people who do not have food security um, and along with food prices that goes back to supplies, importing, and how the US can be sustainable in providing enough food, um, healthy food um, at good prices for the people. Uh, 
other yeah i can oh yeah. sorry oh, go ahead kenzie I can hop on that a little bit with the food insecurity aspect of that. Something that I've learned about a lot in my college career was talking about like agricultural sustainability and just the difficulties that climate change presents to that community. You know, you don't really realize how reliant we are on the industrial food system until it's, you know, threatened in the way that we've seen it in a couple of different ways. And climate change presents a lot of difficulties just with the temperature changes affecting growing rates and growing seasons are going to be changing. And even in my local little garden, I've been seeing some different differences over the past few years about what crops are doing well with the temperature changes as they go throughout the season. And going forward with the agricultural sustainability, it's going to be a really pressing issue that I think it's going to be a, a hot topic for our generation to be focusing on as we go forward. No pun intended, right? <laughs> Um, so I guess just one last quick question. Um, I, a couple of you mentioned climate justice. So uh, we know that certain communities are more vulnerable to and impacted by climate change. And so calls for climate justice are now integrated into the climate action movement. And what does climate justice mean to you? And what do you think needs to be done to ensure an equitable and just response to this crisis? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Um, to me, climate justice is just everyone being able to make empowered decisions for their selves and their communities. Um, and so in order for this to be addressed, I think that we really need to think about the century old systems that we have based on white supremacy and deconstruct them um, and kind of look at our own role that we play in being complicit in these systems as well. So on a broader level, I do think that there needs be, to be reconstruction and in some, case, in some cases abolition of these systems. But on a personal level, I think that education on uh, our own biases and um, promoting and uplifting the voices of others is what we need to do to address this issue. Yeah, absolutely. And building off of that, I think that another thing that needs to be done is really listening to these communities and giving them more platform and more say and more decision making power in what is actually happening to them. All right. Any last thoughts? Because it looks like we have our judges back. So yeah, it's time for us to hear their decision. So I want to thank all of you for, yeah, for coming and chatting with us. And um, we'll be bringing you all back at the very end in case any of the audience members have questions for you. So see you all soon. All right. So at this time, I'd like to introduce one of our trustees at Manomet, uh, Dan Sarles, who will be announcing this year's winner. Dan Sarles serves as executive director of the Eagle Mirror Foundation, a Boston-based family charity that supports numerous conservation organizations locally, nationally, and globally. Dan is a trustee of Manomet, the Nature Conservancy of Massachusetts, and Legato. Additionally, he is a national council member of both World Wildlife Fund and Earth Justice. Dan also serves as managing member of Sarles Family Investments at LLC, an investment partnership focused on private equity and venture capital. Dan lives in Boston's Back Bay, but enjoys traveling as often as his schedule allows. So thank you for being here, Dan. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction. And thank you and your team for your continued hard work in leading and shaping the success of U360 every year. To this year's U360 participants, I offer both gratitude for your participation and congratulation for what you have achieved. You are all surely swimming in graduation speeches, advice both solicited and unsolicited and other forms of career guidance by now. Here's yet some more to add to that burgeoning collection. Uh, first, business interest in sustainability and environmental impact is substantial and increasing. You all know this. You've learned this this year. And those with smarts and experience are highly valued and have a competitive advantage in seeking jobs and promotions. 
this value is not just for specific roles with sustainability or conservation in the title, but across an organization in so many functional roles, management, human resources, technology, finance, marketing, operations, and so on. Even if your career finds you on a path not specifically in sustainability, the knowledge and skills you acquire during your U360 experience will serve you well, proving a critical differentiator right now and going forward. Secondly, U360 is not just about the action plans you each develop for your chosen business or the specific sustainability knowledge you've acquired. U360 is about the broader professional development skills you've enhanced through training and experience, critical thinking, polished presentations as we saw today, confidence in introducing yourself and explaining your ideas, being a self-starter, demonstrating resilience and grit, challenging conversations as many of you mentioned, and coming up with clever solutions to complex problems. I've had several conversations with colleagues and friends in hiring positions who stress that these so-called soft skills are often more important than discipline knowledge. Many times it can be easier to teach someone specific subject matter than it could be to train someone in the abilities your U360 experience has bestowed upon you. Thirdly, your involvement with U360 has another important aspect to it that of being part of the growing success story of the U360 program and of a generational cohort, the climate change generation with the talent, tools, and motivation to save the world from the missteps of earlier generations, specifically the baby boomers and the millennials. I get to blame them because I'm Generation X and of course, none of this is my fault. But back to U360, you're all now part of an expanding family of savvy and capable U360 alums. I encourage you to become an active member of this network that includes all members of the current class, past U360 participants such as this year's judge, Nick Masiello, businesses and other organizations that have benefited from U360 assistance, judges of U360 capstone competitions, Manomet staff such as Laura, Molly, and Claire, Manomet trustees like me and Manomet counselors. You are now part of a powerful network that will only continue to grow. You will be in a position to receive advice from this network, but also to provide help to future U360 enrollees as the A-team has done this year. All this is an underrated and incredibly potent benefit from your U360 journey. Lastly, please keep in mind that as proud as you all surely are in the final product of your U360 work, the true value of your experience is, pardon the cliche, about the journey, not the destination. Yes, as our finalists have shown, it is important to actually arrive at a desired destination. But what you'll remember and find most useful in the years ahead is what you learned along the way in this adventure of self-discovery, confidence building, and professional development. In conclusion, let a middle-aged guy who graduated college 24 years ago suggest that you hold on to the things that helped you this past year. Stay curious, always be learning, demonstrate patience, display empathy, work both smart and hard, ask for help when you need it, and do make some time for fun. And now for the moment that we've all anxious, been anxiously awaiting, I would like to ask that our free, three finalists join us. Our next generation scholar for 2022, winning a $1,000 scholarship from Manomet, is Ching Yi Yi from Boston University for her presentation about a construction company in New Jersey. Thank you. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Yay! Go, Ching Yi! Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely did not expect to be here today. Um, just because graduating and finding a job puts so much pressure. Um, but speaking with Laura, um, and just speaking with Lily and Abby, like that really helped put me to peace and just really helped me complete this um, 
wonderful presentation that I was able to put together due to their help and um, on research and everything. So I would like to thank them. Um, thank you. <laughs> Yay. And congratulations to our first runner up, Anika Majid from Stony Brook, Stony Brook University for her presentation about a metal arts company in the Midwest. She will receive a $500 scholarship from Manomet. And our second runner up, Anna Lofstra from Blesey University for proposal about a food producer in California who will receive a $250 scholarship from Manomet. Those were all awesome. Congrats, you guys. Let's have a final round of applause for all our students, please. Oh, thank you so much, Dan. And yes, a huge congratulations to all of our students and congratulations, Ching Yi our new next generation scholar. Um, and yes, I just this has been yet again a, a wonderful capstone event. So thank you all. Thank you all for being here. All of you out in the audience, thank you for attending. Uh, to learn more about Manomet and our various programs, you can visit us at manomet.org. And I'm sure one of my colleagues will throw the website into the chat for you audience members. Um, I also just I would be remiss if I didn't put it in uh, put in a plug for the fact that we're currently accepting applications for next year's U360 class. So if you know any college students who might be interested, please spread the word and we'll be uh, also putting the link to the job description in that chat. Um, and then I just want to say thank you again to Molly, to our three judges and to Dan. Thank you all for being here and for the role you played in this big event today. And then, um, yeah, just again, a huge round of applause and congratulations to all of the students as they now officially become U360 alums. So if you had a cap, you could turn the tassel and you all are now part of the amazing U360 alumni network. And as Dan so eloquently said, just the whole Manomet community um, at large. So welcome to, to, yeah, crossing over that stage. And I hope to all of you out there that today has given you a healthy helping of hope and optimism. And again, just thank you for being here. And if you would like to talk with me or any of the students, please stick around. And otherwise, I hope you have a great evening.